I'm going to give Jesus a hand clap of praise this morning. Thank him for his kindness and grace and his goodness. As you make your way back, if you, if you haven't hugged the person to, behind you or, ne- or next to you, just tell them that you'll get to them after service, okay? Tell them don't leave until you hug them this morning. Thank you so much for being with us. I know it, we, look, uh, we look scattered today. So many people are out of town for a uh, holiday, and, and then plus uh, Pastor Andy and Scott and their families are all uh, down at, uh, in Boaz or in Gadsden, and they're having an awesome time. I want to say thank you for so many of you that have come out already this, this last week. They opened on, um, on what day was it? Was it Wednesday? Tuesday? I forget. Anyway, uh, Valentine, do you remember what day they opened? Oh, did Okay. Sharon knows. Should have asked. Well, my answer was right there. I don't know why I didn't ask you. But anyway, for all that have helped already and for what you've done, we want to say thank you. And every, as, as Pastor Daniel mentioned, the reason why the money, uh, the reason we're not money centered, money focused, but. We do want um, finances for our missionaries to, so that they can continue to do what they're doing. And so thank you for your generosity. Amen. You know, one of the things that's weird about ministry is that, that sometimes, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm plowing this row and I'm, well, I'm thinking, well, next week's going to be a part two or something, and then, you know, things get changed around and all that. And so this week in my prayer time, I was reminded of something, and uh the Lord put this in my heart to share with you, and so if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn to Psalm 27. We're going to be there for a little bit today. And uh, one of my favorite people in the Bible is a man that was so profoundly um, uh, confusing. I mean, David could write a song like nobody's business, amen? And, uh, and, and then he could, he could do something just magnificent for God and 28 seconds later, he was wanting to blow somebody up or something, and, you know, he was, uh, he was, his emotions were just all over the place, and, and uh, sometimes, you know, we don't think of, we don't typically think of men as being that emotional, but men have emotions too, amen. Sometimes men don't have emotions, they, emotions have them, and, uh, but David is a reminder for us that under any circumstance, under every situation, in any season, that God is worthy of our trust. Can you say Amen. I'm going to read the entire uh, psalm, Psalm 27. It's 14 verses. You can follow along on the screen if you'd like. In fact, if you'd like to read it with me, you're welcome to. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army encamp against me, my heart, say it with me, my heart, one more time, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I would be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. How many of you say amen to that? Let's try it one more time. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless, say it with me, unless, shout it out, unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. 
wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Holy Spirit, thank you for the psalmist. Thank you for the songs. Thank you for the seasons that birthed those songs. Thank you for the circumstances that changed his seasons that birthed those songs. And David's life is a living epistle to us today. That even in great success or great failure, you're still God. You still care. You still have a plan. You're not the kind of God that discards and throws away the clay. Even when we mess up royally, even then, even then, you meet us with mercy. Father, thank you for mercy. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for, thank you for believing the best about us when we give you all the opportunity in the world to think the worst of us. Thank you for staying with us, sticking with us, instead of pulling up plan B. God, you're so faithful. You're so faithful. Lift your hands with me one more time, would you? Lord, we, we just acknowledge your faithfulness. God, you're so faithful. No matter what is going on around us or even in us, you're the same. Hallelujah. You're the same. You never change. Your ways are perfect. You're gracious, compassionate, and merciful. You're kind. You're so patient. And God, today we acknowledge that just like David, we can be a bundle of paradoxes. We can be as high as a kite on Sunday and as low as a snake on Monday. But you're the same every day in every season. And God, that's why our faith, though shaken, though shaken severely at times, is unchanging. Because our God is the same. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We honor you. Holy Spirit, take these words and sow them into the soil of every heart in this room. And those who may be watching online, we pray in the name of Jesus that you'll begin a work that will produce a harvest both now and in eternity. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. One of the funny things about David to me was that God called him a man after his own heart. Now, if I was going to choose somebody to represent me, I think I'd be real careful about what he looked like. Come on, help me out, somebody. Uh, I'd be careful, you know, of, of, his, of his comportment and, you know, just his mannerisms and all. I want, I want something that was pretty similar to me. And yet David, in so many ways, gave God plenty of opportunity to say, you know what, you've blown it. I've, I've, just, I've gone as far as I can with you. I, I'm really, I don't want to do this, but as bad as I hate to, I'm just going to have to scrap the whole plan and I'm going to have to find somebody else and work with him. You know, when God puts his spirit in you and he claims you, from that point on, you belong to him. You belong to him. And he will use whatever means necessary to reiterate to you time and time again. You can run. You can hide. You can flee to the farthest mountain. You can do all kinds of things. But I'm going to tell you something. I know, I know all about you. I know your hiding places. I'll find you. How many of you ever tried to hide from, from God and you just, you know, I'm going, to go, I'm going to go on vacation. I'm going to leave him here. I'm going to go to the beach. No? He's at the beach. Amen, somebody. Wherever, wherever we go, God is there. God, God refers to David as a man after his own heart. And I've asked myself many times, with, Deb, with David's failures, how could God do that? Let me understand that just because you and I make mistakes does not mean that God's, he's not keeping score in the sense of, uh, well, that's a, that's a plus, that's a minus, that's a minus, uh-oh, we're in a row, that's a minus. No. God declares us righteous. He sees us as righteous. The Bible says that we are 
the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so even if we fail and stagger and stumble at times, God does not change his mind. Just nudge your neighbor and tell them God is not changing his mind about you. He's not. He's just not doing it. There's a, one of the stories that, uh, about David in the Bible. Uh, is, well, I've got 47 favorites, but I won't go to all of them. But one of my favorite stories today, I want to share with you this morning. Look up with me at, at 1 Samuel chapter 30. Did you bring your Bible? Hallelujah. I'm so glad you did. 1 Samuel chapter 30. It's way back in the Old Covenant. This is one of the worst times ever in David's life. If I were God and, and if I were putting the Bible together, I would put all the positives there. I would put all the victories and the highlights and not the lowlights. And, and, and uh, in chapter 30, there's a, a, a real issue here. And everything that happens in David's life, everything that happened from his father's rejecting him when he was a child, some, he was the eighth. He was the eighth son. David's dad said, I have seven sons. No, David was the eighth. He was out uh, tending the sheep. Everything that happened in David's life from being rejected, from being ignored, from being discounted, all those things, everything played into his destiny. So when you think about where God is taking you, well, I don't know how he's going to work this into the story. I don't, I don't know how he can, how, how can work that into the story. I, I'm not sure I'm going to make it. I'm not sure I'm going to be where I need to be. God knows just where you are and just what he's got to do to get you on his schedule. Come on, talk to me, somebody, to, to work with you and to get you right where he wants you to be. I want to show you uh, t- this morning a, a, a verse. The, one of the s- saddest things to me is on, on a, in, in a time of incredible victory, David vanquishes the Philistines. He just, he, he mops them up. And he comes home, and guess what? All the families of the soldiers that went and won this war, they come home and the town's empty. All the women and children were taken. And the same guys that fought side by side with David said, I'm with you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'm right here beside you. When they got home and the women and children were gone, guess what they did to David? We're going to eat you for lunch. That's why you can't be addicted to popular opinion or even friendships at times because sometimes the folks that, does, that say I'm with you, no, they, they're with you while it's good. Can I get a witness someplace? God's not a fair weather God. He's with you all the time. So David goes back to, to the camp, and, and, and all, everybody's gone. Look at chapter 30, verse number 6, if you would, please. 1 Samuel ch- chapter 30, verse number 6. Well, let, let's begin in verse 1. You know me. I, I, I can't help myself. Now, it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziklag attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken captive the women and those who were with them were there. From small to great, they did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to, to the city, and there, there it was, their city, burned with fire. I mean, this is a, they torched this place. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with, with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. They wept themselves dry. There was not anything in them. And David's two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Read verse 6 with me. Ready? Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters, Read that last sentence one more time out loud. Ready? But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. See, at at, at times, when you and I are asking and wondering what is God doing or not doing in our lives, what he's doing is he's he's recalibrating us. He's figuring and reconfiguring our souls because he knows the next battle that we're going to deal with. Can I get a witness someplace? You may be in a time of victory today. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Thank God for it. But see, there's, there's always, there's, there's going to be a bump in the road. There's going to be a detour. There's going to be an unexpected change of plans. Something will change. God is always sowing into us so that when we meet our Ziklag, 
when we arrive at, at our destination and realize that everything that we work for is gone. Can I get a witness someplace today? See, uh, that's when you find out what you're really made of. You don't find out what you're made of when, time, when times are great and everybody loves you and pats you on the back and wants to buy you a meal. Buy you a meal. That's not when you find out what you're made of. You find out what you're made of when, you don't, when everything you, you, you believe was yours is gone. And the very people that fought with David spoke of stoning him. I don't know about you, but I could think of no, other, of no worse uh, form of, of, of death than that. But those, those last several words, that last sentence in verse 6, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. See, it's what you do in the good times that prepare you to survive in the bad times. Most people believe that the Christian life is like a, it's like an amusement park ride. They just go from one fun thing to the next fun thing, and if things aren't fun here, let's go find fun someplace else. No, no, this, it's not an amusement park ride. And you, sometimes it does feel like we're on a roller coaster. Amen, somebody. We're, or or, or, or a, what do you call those things? Ferris wheel, yeah. And, you know, we're up and we're down. We're all around. But, but you've got to recognize as a believer that you've got to do something about this right here. Put your hand right there. What, what are you hiding in your heart? Because what you hide in there today is what prepares you for what may happen tomorrow. You can't call a friend all the time. Come on, talk to me, somebody. You, you've, got to, you've got to invest in your heart. What scares me about the body of Christ these days is we become addicted to sound bites. We post somebody else's picture or, or somebody else's uh, cliche or quip or quote or whatever. I don't know how to say this any other way than, than to say it. I, listen, a, a clever slogan is wonderful. But it compares not in one iota to the least jot or tittle of the word, word of God. And so you've got to hide the word in your heart. You've got to get it in your heart. You've got to keep it in your heart because trouble is coming. I said trouble is coming. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to talk about it. But it's just it's reality. Let me tell you why David was qualified to talk about trouble. Let me just share with you a few things he experienced. He was pursued by King Saul. He barely escaped several assassination attempts, including the one I just talked about in 1 Samuel chapter 30. He had to spend time hiding in the wilderness, feigning his madness. Could you imagine? The Bible one time talks about David. He's with, he's, he's with the adversary who wants to kill him. And the, the Bible says he's, he's let, letting drool. Go ahead and do it. Try it, guys. He's letting drool just, just fall down over his, over his beard. He's like a crazy man, letting spittle gather on his beard. What was, what was he doing? This guy had to do all kinds of things. He went to every possible emotional level or experience. Listen, if you think that's bad, it gets worse. His entire family was kidnapped. We just read that. His friends turn, turned against him and were ready to kill him. We just read that. He suffered the shame of having committed adultery and murder. He committed adultery with Bathsheba and had, his hus had her husband, uh, Uriah, murdered. His son, Amnon, raped the, his daughter, Tamar. And then his other son, Absalom, murdered Amnon in revenge. Absalom led a revolt against his dad, and Absalom himself was killed, and David saw it and wept bitterly. I don't know about you, but if I was going to choose somebody to be a leading man in the Bible, I would not have chosen somebody like David. Because that guy had all these. He had these ups, and he had these downs. He had this, these wonderful mountaintop experiences, which most of them made him into, into the Psalms, and we sing some of those Psalms. But man, he had some of the worst, the snottiest, the awfulest times ever. I don't know about you, but I, I thank God that He's not a fair weather God. Can I get a witness someplace in here? Listen, he's with me on the mountain time. Hallelujah. He's with me in my highest moment, but he's also with me in the lowest possible place I can go. You know when you don't feel like you've got a friend? When you, the, the people you're trying to call and want to ask for prayer support or prayer, uh, a prayer partner or whatever, their number's busy, and then it goes to voicemail, and, and you leave a desperate message, please, I'm in the worst season of my life. Please call me at your earliest convenience. And they don't call you, and then the next day you do it, and it goes to voicemail, and you ask them to call you, and, and then you realize about three days into it, wait, wait a minute, I've got to do this myself. Just because you're alone does not mean God's abandoned you. See, sometimes God lets you go through situations and get right smack dab in the middle of it all by yourself to recognize he's all I need. He's all I need. You know why? Friends will fail you. But Jesus is a friend that sticks closer, closer than a brother. Can you say Amen. 1 Samuel 36, verse number 6. David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. 
Joseph T. Bailey was a brilliant writer. He lived a very brief life. He had seven children, and three of those children died when they were infants. Joseph Bailey wrote books about his experiences as a father and leading a family through those three seasons of grief. And he made this statement that should serve us well in our lifetimes. He said, don't forget in the darkness what you learned in the light. Joseph Bailey said this. He said, it was what I learned when I was in my, when, when all was going well. He said, you can't read when your tears are filled with eyes, your eyes are filled with tears. He said, all I could do was breathe my prayers through tears. He said this. He said, God ministered to me in my worst moments. And I found that even though I lost three of my children, I didn't lose them. I just loaned them to him to reclaim them when I get to heaven. David speaks to us of many things, but one of them is this. God uses nobody that's perfect. I like this reality. Read it with me, please. God factored in our flaws. Let's try it one more time in stereo. Ready? God factored in our flaws when he chose and called us. That means all of our mess-ups. You know, we... We experience history one day at a time forward. But God is outside of time. He already knows everything that ever happened or ever will happen. And so before he, before he set his affection on us, he knew our hang-ups, our hold-ups, our flaws, our warts and all. And God still chose us. Just know your neighbor and tell them, I'm special. Just to make sure that you know that. Let's go back to Psalm 27. Y'all doing all right so far? Read it with me, please. The Lord is my light. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Verse 2. When the wicked came against me, eat up my flesh. My enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Verse 3. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. I love that. Though war may rise against me, in this I would be confident. Friend, I want to encourage you to do something today. I don't know how your devotional life is. Some people have a sporadic one. It's, well, if I get to it, if I have time, if I find the time. I want to encourage you. If you've never done this before, I want to challenge you with this today. Schedule a time with God and do not violate that schedule. Y'all with me? I mean, if I'm you... And I don't know, when I was younger, I didn't like getting up in the morning. But anyway, that's a different story in my, in my life these days. But, but, but my suggestion is that you get along with God early before you face anybody else and deal with anything else. Because God can meet you in your prayer closet. God can talk to you. He can condition you. He can teach you some things. He can prepare you for what you're going to do when you walk out the door. One of my favorite things about this psalm is the revelation of David's emotions. He's all over the place. He's like one of those seismographs, you know, that measures, that monitors, you know, that measures whatever those things are, yeah. And it goes, it just, it's through the roof. Then it kind of levels out. It's just almost still. And through the roof. And sometimes, aren't our lives like that? Some days, it just smooths sailing. Other days, it's like, all of hell has come against me today. Satan must hate my guts. He, he's trying to push all my buttons. How many know that sometimes, it just, just when you think you, that you've outfoxed him and with him, he finds another button. Come on, talk to me, somebody. And so if, if you let your mind go there, you can become so just obsessed with this. I know people that think more about the devil than they do about God. Just, 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 just look down there. Just look at the bottom of your shoe. Pastor Glenn, what in, the, what in the world are you doing? We sing it. It was a song made popular back in the Browns Road Bible. I went to the enemy's camp. You hear Violet? She should jump up here and go for us. I went to the enemy's camp and took back what he stole from me. God is in the restoration business, and sometimes he'll, he'll let you go right back into the enemy's camp where he stole something from you and take it back. 
Because he wants you to understand something. You have the authority. You have the authority. He's under my feet. Say it with me. He's under my feet. Satan is under my feet. Now, I can let him out if I want to. That's not a good, good thing to do. Amen? That's why I got him in 205, so you still have 431 and all those devils on it. Amen. Ed Welch said, Worry's magnetic attraction can only be broken by a stronger attraction. And David is saying in Psalm 27, we can only find the attraction in God himself. His, this is how he said it in verse 4. He said, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You know, life is all about pursuit. It's all about what you value. People can tell what you value by what you pursue and what you acquire and accumulate. Amen. What do we want most? We want, we want God. We want, God. we want experience of God, encounters with God every single day. Can I get a witness, witness someplace? David said, one thing, somebody shout, one thing. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Brother Tozier said it this way. He said, the world is perishing for lack of the knowledge of God, and the church is famishing for want of his presence. The instant cure of most of our religious ills will be to enter into his presence in spiritual experience, to become suddenly aware that we are in God and that God is in us. What we need most of all is an awareness. It, that's what's missing. It's not the presence of God. It's our awareness of the presence of God. He's everywhere. Can I get a witness someplace? See, the kids just said it. They just gave me a testimony. Charles G. Finney said this. He said, if the presence of God is in the church, the church will draw the world in. If the presence of God is not in the church, the world will draw the church out. What are we seeing in our generation? We've proven that nice buildings, pretty buildings, big buildings, big crowds, that does not change a cotton-picking thing because that is, all that does is attract and, att and, and tempt the flesh because we're moved by what we see. My brother, my sister, we're spirit people. We're people of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God lives inside of us. The same power that got Jesus up out of a grave lives inside of us. That's not what attracts us. The world doesn't attract us because it has nothing for us. It's the presence of God we want. Can somebody say amen? I look forward to the day when people go to the church, not because it's new, not because it's novel, but because people there have cultivated an awareness. He's here. He's here. He's here. Say it with me. He's here. He's here. He really is. David said this in conviction. He said, for in the time of trouble, he shall... I'm sorry, I can't hear you. He shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. What's that about? There are moments when you are being pursued by your own sins. I'm not getting no help in here this morning. That's okay. I feel like I'm in a Baptist church. All right. There are some times, I, there's some times, I don't know about you. Maybe, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about me. There's some, there's some seeds I've sown in my past. I pray to God Almighty that never come up. There have been times things happened in my past leaked out. And I began to think to myself, God, I'm going to be exposed. I went through a very, very difficult season. The most difficult season of my life in 1984 my first challenge of faith I wanted to run I wanted to see if I could get away with it Tim you know what I'm talking about sometimes you just want to get away so I skipped church for, for two weeks two Sundays man it was awful longest two weeks of my whole life in the middle of all that stuff I was driving from Wilderness Lane in, in, center, in the center point area trustful area down 459 toward Hoover. I was going about 80 miles an hour in the slow lane. And I was having it out with the Lord. I had these feelings and fears. And I'm driving down 459. We're down in traffic, and I'm, I'm praying before I get to the office. I, Lord, I, just, I need a word. I, I, need, I need to know that, that, that you're hearing me. Valentine, in the middle of that awful season of my life, I said, Lord, what, what are you trying to do? He said, I'm trying to convince you that it's under the blood. 
How long will you intend, do you intend on paying for something that I forgot and buried in your past? It is buried. It's not coming back because it's dead. It's under the blood. Hallelujah. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of this tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. I love this psalm in Psalm 32. He said, you are my hiding place. Say it with me. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble. Y'all, hey, stand up with me. You can't talk. You can't, you, you can't confess the scripture when you're sitting down. You've got to get that, that option, that, your lungs inv- uh, involved. Ready? You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. One more time, you sound great. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I'm going to tell you something, saints. When you feel like something from your past is going to track you down and, and find you and crawl up in your lap and, and mess up everything God has done in your life, the devil is a liar. I said the devil is a liar. He can do all that he wants to to, to, to to rattle some cages and all back there. But as far as God's concerned, if you're in Christ Jesus, it's as if you were already in heaven. Pastor Glenn, I'm not sure I want to go there with you. That's, that's the ultimate predestination. I know. It's in the Bible. You ought to read it sometime before you argue about it. Amen. But God has already, he's already, we're seated in heavy places. Why? Because God is working in our lives. Just nudge your neighbor and tell them, I'm sure glad God's working on you. He needs to. Amen. You can sit down. Y'all doing all right? David continues. He says, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not one of those, I'm, I'm really not a jerky kind of guy. I don't like to gloat or nothing like that. It's, you know, even my favorite team wins a championship or something. I don't call my friends on the other side and say, nan and a boo-boo, I don't do that stuff. I'm not like that. But this is different. David says, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Could you imagine? Jeff, could you imagine what, what, what David's enemies felt? Seeing this one, they hated, they despised him, and instead of being, instead of being eliminated or replaced, he's exalted. His head's exalted. He says, therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Verse 7, hear, O Lord. This is so powerful. When I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. I, I came this morning to tell you one thing. Here it is. It's coming up. You'll see a picture in a second. There's a turning point in every trial. There's a turning point in every trial. Some people think they get in one lane and they can't get out. No, God always arranges a turning point. And whatever you're going through right now, whatever you're fighting, maybe, it, maybe it's a memory of the past. Maybe it's something from your past. Maybe, you're, maybe you can't get off of that. You just you feel like, well, I didn't pay, I didn't pay the penalty. I, I, I didn't grieve enough or didn't repent enough or whatever. Stop it. Stop it. Today's your turning point. No, your neighbor tell them, today's your turning point. This is a turning point in every trial. Now, here's why I know this is a turning point, because the next verse, something radical happens. David says, when you said, seek my face, when did God tell him that? When did you tell him? Verse 7 said, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. At the moment you cry, at the moment you cry, at the moment you cry, how many have a baby? Have little babies? Perish the thought. Amen. How, how many of you have babies? How long do you wait for that child? Well, let's see if he's really sick. Remember the first child? You know, this is, they, they, they had, this is me and Diane, we had our babies before they had those monitor things. And so... Nowadays, they got monitors. And the mothers, and they're, they're, they're only, they're like 17 feet away from them, right? And, and they got the monitors, and they got the monitor t- turned up to the, to the highest level. But they hear a, uh, 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 they run, they rush to, to sit, check on their baby. David says, when you said, when who said? When God said. When God says, seek my face, my heart. Say it with me. My heart, one more time, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. See, experiencing the presence of God is the ultimate purpose for a child of God. 
I love coming to church not because I love to see the gray carpet and the gray chairs and the gray banister and the black whatever. I, that, it's, it's just a shed. It's just a building. It's, it's, I thank God for it. Amen, somebody. The purpose for coming to church is not so I can count how many squares there are on the carpet or, or, or see how many bodies are in the seats. The, the purpose of coming to the church is the presence of God. How long has it been since you experienced the presence of God? I know some folks, we met some people in, years ago in Missouri, and they called themselves spiritual junkies, and I didn't know what the term meant. And uh, about a third week there, one of the guys, the husband said, we won't be at church tomorrow. And I said, oh, okay. And uh, he said, uh, we're going to go over to here. And I thought maybe a family member lived there or something, whatever. But they were the, they were the kind of folks that chased if they heard something was going on over here, they chased it. Woo! 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 Glory, glory, glory. God's moving over here. Let's, let's camp here for a while. And then when things kind of set, how many know that what, what goes up must come? Yeah. And so, so, so things kind of settled a little bit, and, and then they, they came back to church for a week or so, and they said, well, we're looking for the next move of God. And I said, how about you be in the next move of God? That way, instead of going and chasing it, you can just stand there and just, just enjoy the presence of God. Amen, somebody? David says, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. This is our declaration. Read it with me, the last three lines. Ready? You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. In verse 10, when my father and my mother forsake me. I want to tell you something, saints. I don't, care who, who, I don't care who walks out on you. I don't care who disappoints you. I don't care who breaks your heart. It doesn't matter. If God be for you, who can be against you? And he will find you. He will comfort you. He will draw you to his side, and he will tell you, you are mine. I told you you were mine. Don't argue with me. Or maybe he won't talk to you like that. He's talked to me that way before. You're mine. I put, my, I, I put my spirit in you. I put my presence in you, and you are mine. David continues. He said, teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. Verse 13, I would have lost heart unless I had believed. Past tense, I, I, I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Can somebody say amen? And he, he gives us his counsel in, in conclusion. He says, wait on the Lord. How many have a wait problem? W-A-I-T, not W-E-I-G-H-T. How many like everything quick? I like the drive-through. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Because when I get there, if there's two cars, okay, don't ask me to wait to be happy about it. Choir, I'm sure glad you're backing me up today. I'm not feeling much love out here. Amen. I don't like to wait. David says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say. Let's read this verse together. Ready? Wait on the Lord. I can't hear you. Wait, I say. Here's why it's important. We are living in a dangerous and deadly time. People are literally, I think, I think you, you, you will bear witness, people in our culture, they are three-fourths three of the way lit. And the slightest nudge or bump, they're going to go off. I don't know about you, but we're living in some dangerous times. We truly are. How do you sleep in times like this? How can, you lay down your, how can you lay your head down at night and sleep? You can only do it if the spiritual man has authority over the natural man. I, I want to share this with you this morning. Some years ago, I've shared this story a thousand times, so you've probably heard it before. The lady of church put a book in my hand called The Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee. And I, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I knew Jesus. I was saved. I was born again. I was going to heaven. I knew it. 
And when Bessie Smith gave me that book, I began reading about this, this Chinese missionary and the way he taught and wrote. He didn't write. His messages were trans, transcribed and, 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 and duplicated. About the spiritual man, I recognized something. Just because you get saved does not mean the old man is dead. He is dead as far as God is concerned. But you know and I know that we can resurrect that dead man anytime we get good and cotton picking ready. The spiritual man must take dominion over the natural man. We are far too carnal. I said we are far too carnal. We claim that we're spiritual. I've seen and heard things out of Christians I never thought I would see or hear. You know why? Because Jesus is alive and well on Sunday, but by 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, guess who's back? Nudge your neighbor and tell them, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. The spiritual man must take dominion over the natural man. The natural man will overthrow and fight and antagonize the spiritual man. The spiritual man is centered in Jesus. We find our identity in Jesus alone. We find our value and worth in Jesus alone. If you are spiritual, no matter what comes, good or bad, it's, it, it's, just, it's just stuff. Amen, somebody. It's just stuff. It's, it, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm, new, I'm moved by the spirit, of, the, the spirit of God inside me. Stand with me this morning. I want to, I, I'm begging you, my friend, my brother, my sister, if you're fighting that war and you cannot get victory over that thing in the name of Jesus, I'm telling you right now, I know the key to victory. I know the key to victory. See, Paul said it this way. He said, I die daily. There's sometimes, you can go into, into a baptismal tank, and that's a symbol of resurrection life is what that is. You go down the old, and you come up brand new. Hallelujah, somebody. Isn't it wonderful? But you know what happens to that person that gets in the baptismal? They go, they change clothes, they walk back out into the natural world. Sometimes they forget what happened there. The old man is gone. The old man is gone. Say it with me. The old man is gone. He's gone. He has no right or authority over me unless I give it to him. And there's a lot of things going on in our world right now. You're going to be, you're going to be, you're going to be paranoid is what you're going to be. You're going to be sick. Seeing what you see. I don't know about you, but sometimes some, a report comes over television. I don't listen to, I don't watch news. I can't do it. I've I, I got to keep my spirit right. Sometimes I'll hear something, and I'm thinking to myself, ooh, if I, the old Glenn, ooh, there'd be, a, there'd be a, a problem here. And I had to remind myself, I'm dead. My life is in with Christ and God. Say it with me. I'm dead. Come on out loud, just like you mean it. I'm dead. My real life is hidden with Christ in God. One more time. I'm dead. My real life is hidden with Christ in God. You have to repeat that to yourself. And tell you, you got to preach to yourself sometimes. Because the natural man is always waiting. All he wants is one, just a tiny, tiny sliver of light. There's a chance. There's a chance. You and I. Look at your shoe one more time. Remember David's sins that were under the blood? Are you with me? So are yours. Just do this. Just do it. Come on, one more time. My sins are under the blood. The old man's under the blood. He does not have authority over me. I will not let him have my voice. I will not let him have my mind. I will not, not let him have my body. My body belongs to Jesus. Every, every part of me. Body, soul, and spirit, I belong to Jesus. Father, today, if there is anyone in this room that is fighting a battle, and sometimes it feels like the natural man is winning, Sometimes it feels like the old man is coming back. God, sometimes in our minds, that war, it's not, nobody sees it on the outside, but we sure do feel it on the inside. God, today we want victory. We want victory in the name of Jesus over what was over the claims of the old man, 
over the sins of the old man, over the habits of the old man. Father, thank you that your word declares that we are the habitation of the Holy Spirit. The old man is dead. Say it with me. The old man is dead. Father, this morning we come as your people asking you, Lord, to deliver us from our enemies. To keep us by the power of God. To guard us as your heritage. Lord, let your precious spirit, let your precious Holy Spirit have ascendancy and priority in our lives. Father, we know that if we are left to ourselves, we can wreck the whole thing. So God, today we come as people who have died to the flesh and who have been raised again in Christ Jesus. Father, I give you myself give you myself, all of me, my past, my present, my future. Help me. Help me to maintain victory. Hallelujah, Jesus. Help me to maintain the victory. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, when I'm weak and weary, when I'm tired, when I'm being pursued by my adversaries, remind me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If that's you, come and stand with me this morning. All over this altar area, come on. 